on a three-corner draft stating that he would return someday. And that was the last of Lono. He was never seen any more. His raft got swamped, perhaps. But the people always expected his return, and thus they were easily led to accept Captain Cook as the restored god. Some of the old natives believed Cook was Lono to the day of their death, but many did not, for they could not understand how he could die if he was a god. Only a mile or so from Kala. Kukea Bay is a spot of historic interest, the place where the last battle was fought for idolatry. Of course we visited it, and came away as wise as most people do who go and gaze upon such mementos of the past when in an unreflective mood. While the first missionaries were on their way around the Horn, the idolatrous customs which had obtained in the, in the island as far back as tradition reached were suddenly broken up. Old Kamahumea the first was dead, and his son Leholeho, the new king, was a free liver, a roistering, desolate fellow, and hated the restraints of the ancient taboo. His assistant in the government, Kahumanu, the queen dowager, was proud and high spirited and hated the taboo because it respected restricted the privileges of her sex and degraded all women very nearly to the level of brutes. So the case stood. Leholeho was half a, had half a mind to put his foot down. Kahumanu had a whole mind to badger him into doing it, and Whiskey did the rest. It was probably the first time Whiskey ever prominently figured as an aid to civilization. Leholeho came up to Kalua as drunk as a piper and attended a great feast, the determined queen spurred his drunken courage up to a reckless pitch, and then while all the multitudes started, stared in black dismay, he moved deliberately forward and sat down with the women. They saw him eat from the same vessel with them and were appalled. Terrible mo moments drifted slowly by, and still the king ate, still he lived. Still the lightnings of the insulted gods were withheld. Then conviction came like a revelation. The superstitions of a hundred generations passed from before the people like a cloud, and a shout went up. The taboo is broken. The taboo is broken. Thus did King Leholeho and his dreadful whiskey preach the first sermon and prepare the way for the new gospel that was speeding southward over the waves of the Atlantic. The taboo broken and destruction failing to follow the awful sacrilege, the people with the childlike precipitancy, which was, has always characterized them, jumped to the conclusion that their gods were a weak and wretched swindle, just as they formally jumped to the conclusion that Captain Cook was no god merely because he groaned and promptly killed him without stopping to inquire whether a god might not groan as well as a man if it suited his convenience to do it, and satisfied that the idols were powerless to protect themselves, they went to work at once and pulled them down, hacked them to pieces, applied the torch, annihilated them. The pagan priests were furious, and well they might be. They had held the fattest offices in the land, and now they were beggared. They had been great. They had stood above the chiefs, and now they were vagabonds. They raised a revolt. They scared a number of people into joining their standard. The Beku Kalani, an ambitious offshoot of royalty, was easily persuaded to become their leader. In the first skirmish, the idolaters triumphed over the royal army sent against them, and full of confidence, they resolved to march upon Kalua. The king sent an envoy to try and conciliate them, and came very near being an envoy short by the operation. The savages not only refused to listen to him, but wanted to kill him. So the king sent his men forth under Major General Kalimoku, and the two hosts met at, Kaum at Kumo, 
The battle was long and fierce, men and women fighting side by side, as was the custom. And when the day was done, the rebels were flying in every direction in hopeless panic, and idolatry and the taboo were dead in the land. The royalists marched gaily home to Kalua, glorifying the new dispensation. There is no power in the gods, said they. They are a vanity and a lie. The army with idols was weak. The army without idols was strong and victorious. The nation was without a religion. The missionary ship arrived in safety shortly afterward, timed by providential exactness to meet the emergency, and the gospel was planted as in a virgin soil. Chapter 73 Native Canoes Surf Bathing A Sanctuary How Built The Queen's Rock Curiosities Petrified Lava At noon we hired a Kanaka to take us down to the ancient ruins at Hunanu in his canoe, price two dollars, reasonable enough for a sea voyage of eight miles, counting both ways. The native canoe is an irresponsible looking contrivance. I cannot think of anything to liken it to but a boy's sled runner hollowed out. And that does not cut quite convey the correct idea. It is about fifteen feet long high and pointed at both ends, is a foot and a half or two feet deep, and so narrow that if you wedged a fat man into it, you might not get him out again. It sits on top of the water like a duck, but it has an outrigger and does not upset easily if you keep still. The outrigger is formed of two long bent sticks like plow handles, which project from one side into their outer ends, is bound a curved beam composed of an extremely light wood which skims along the surface of the water and thus saves you from an upset on that side while the outrigger's weight is not so easily lifted as to make an upset on the other side a thing to be greatly feared still until one gets used to sitting perched upon this knife blade he is apt to reason with himself that it would be more comfortable if there were just an outrigger or so on the other side also. I had the bow seat, the bow seat, and Billings sat amidships and faced the Kanaka, who occupied the stern of the craft, and did the paddling. With the first stroke, the trim shell of a thing shot out from the shore like an arrow. There was not much to see, while we were on the shallow water of the reef, it was past time to look down into the limpid depths at the large bunches of branching coral, the unique shrubbery of the sea. We lost that, though, when we got out into the dead blue water of the deep. But we had the picture of the surf then, dashing angrily against the crag-bound shore and sending a foaming spray high into the air. There was interest in this beef beetling border too, for it was honeycombed with quaint caves and arches and tunnels, and had a rude semblance of the dilapidated architecture of ruined keeps and castles rising out of the restless sea. When this novelty ceased to be a novelty, we turned our eyes shoreward and gazed at the long mountain with its rich green forests stretching up into the curtaining clouds and at the specks of houses in the rearward distance, and the diminished schooner riding sleepily at anchor. And when these grew tiresome, we dashed boldly into the midst of a school of huge, beastly porpoises, engaged at their eternal game of arching over a wave and disappearing, and then doing it over again and keeping it up, always circling over in that way like so many well-submerged wheels, but the porpoises wheeled themselves away, and then we were thrown upon our own resources. 
It did not take many minutes to discover that the sun was blazing like a bonfire and that the weather was of a melting temperature. It was a drowsing effect, too. In one place we came upon a large company of naked natives of both sexes and all ages, amusing themselves with the national pastime of surf bathing. Each heathen would paddle three or four hundred yards out to sea, taking a short board with him, then face the shore and wait for a particularly prodigious billow to come along. At the right moment he would fling his board upon its foamy crest, and himself upon the board,